It feels a kind of very fine thing to be welcoming Raoul back uh, to give a lecture. Um, most of you in this room will know, but there may be some who don't, that Raoul taught here, uh, I guess, for nearly 20 years. Uh, 18 or something? 13. What? 13. Oh, 13. Yes. Yeah. Uh, during which time he established himself as an extremely imaginative and influential teacher. Uh, and I'm sure you'll see why this evening. Um, in addition to his teaching uh, at the AA, uh, Raoul also went on to found uh, Cora, um, a kind of uh, umbrella for the kind of research into architecture and urbanism. From 1995 to 2002, he was a tutor at the Berlaga uh, and continues to teach there kind of from time to time. He's also been visiting professor at Columbia University um, and has kind of taught and made installations around the world. Um, within the context of Cora, uh, he's developed a whole range of concepts such as urban curation and the open source planning tool, Urban Gallery. Uh, his lecture this evening is entitled Taschenwelt, uh, and we welcome Raoul very much. Thank you, Mark. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here and to speak to you. And uh, we'll talk about uh, Taschenwelt, which are small, small worlds, and how school are such small worlds. I, I brought one with me. This is a Taschenwelt. And it is a uh, yeah, very small world, or in this case, a model of a small world. And uh, I brought another one, actually, slightly larger. So a bit rougher. The other one was very smooth. And uh, this Taschenwelt still fits in a pocket, kind of large pocket. Uh, you begin to see the, the roughness of, of the surface. Could be the weather, could be any kind of uh, agitation. <coughs> brought a larger one. This comes from a workshop I did in Tokyo long ago. It's in the Japanese uh, fireworks bowl. And uh, I think what's nice to see is that, that well, let's say we're, we're here somewhere. We, I mean, now the AA, we're somewhere here, which means we're on this spot in this room, but at the same time, we're part of this, this, this flux this, this movement, which goes, as you can see, goes all the way around this, this, little, this little world. Of course, this is just a, just a model. But you can, uh, you can increase this endlessly until we come to the right, right size. But we need this kind of model. We need this kind of model in order to place ourselves and to, to have an idea of, of, of the way we are in, in context. So, in other words, we need to construct small worlds all the time to understand the kind of world we're living in and to, in order to deal with it. And the, well, the whole history of architecture and urbanism is, is of course, based on, on the creation of, of, of small models of things that are very large, very complex. But they're small enough in order to, for us to see this complexity and see the relationship between things. This is a quite important thing to understand the relationship between things so that you can also understand that if you act, you build a wall, you build something, anything, that, that, that you understand the consequences of your action, how these larger things uh, change. We're, we're all talking about globalism all the time, but it, it's really just, just like that, it's just a round ball. Uh, but we're going around there on and on. So it is really just a kind of poetic concept. 
Now, the, uh, although we are, we are here, and this whole discussion is about, well, what is going to happen, Mr. AA. Um, two things are, I, I looked once more at the uh, results of last year and uh, perspectives of this year, and it looks incredibly exciting. It's an enormous range of potential that you get once you enroll here. And, uh, and yet, the, 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 the landscape of schools itself is changing radically. Uh, Jeff already talked about uh, the usual suspects, uh, Sayark and Columbia and Cooper, but there's a whole raft of other schools that are actually emerging uh, right now, and for very different kind of reasons. Uh, you know, Penn, University of Pennsylvania is stirring with J Jim Corner. MIT is stirring, uh, not heard of for a long time, but actually things are happening there. There are people now teaching at other places you never heard of before, in San Diego, before, but, uh, for, for example, Terry, Terry Crooks. He's teaching, uh, he's working on cross-border connection between uh, the United States and, and Mexico. Quite new conditions uh, he's teaching. Uh, of course, the Berlage we know already, especially uh, during his period uh, dur uh, under Will Arads, now under Alejandro. Anguant in Vienna. Bauhaus and Dessau, a group of very young German teachers doing quite radical things. There are even those things that I would call non-schools. Philip Oswald is doing things that are practically edu education, but they are still in the form of exhibitions. I told him he should actually set up a school in Berlin and teach what he's doing with the exhibition. Uh, Bartlett, of course, under Peter Cooks. Rain and Christian Hawley and Cass Elster has currently in Delft. Uh, and of course, uh, the newest, perhaps one of the latest, uh, Robert Mull, uh, doing quite good work at, at the London Metropolitan University. So there is a question, uh, how do you place yourself in, in that shifting landscape of, uh, of education, where also quite new discoveries are, are being made? Um, now, let me go back to the, uh, to the, yeah, the birth or rebirth of, of both architecture and of schools. And the uh, Taschenbelts are also um, worlds that are small narratives. It's about the birth of architecture. And uh, yeah, some of the projects I developed were actually such narratives. They were personal narratives that dealt with the birth of architecture. And uh, one of the projects I did was a whole series of spheres. And I, I, I tried to deliberate at what moments this cut uh, made in the skin of the earth in such a way that, that, that you locate yourself and that you have the beginning uh, of architecture. So how do we create a mark? How do we create uh, an order? How do we create space in this, in this skin of the earth? I think there's a part of uh, a school being at Taschenwelt is being able to do things in a small way that reflect larger things without being punished immediately. <laughs> for the unreality of them. So there's a whole history of, of cosmologies, architectural cosmologies. There's a whole history of cosmogenies, the birth of, uh, birth of architecture. Um, one, for example, was made uh, by a group of students and a group of teachers years ago here, right in front of the school. Uh, we built a, an object called the Collapse of Time by um, uh, by John Hayduck, and that was another cosmology we had to do with the you know, collapse of time, and in a very small uh, small period of a series of weeks, you experienced that it was literally following the time. Time is a very different thing, difficult thing for architects. Uh, we continuously struggle with it. We make space, we make buildings, but we don't often realize we actually make time as well, and we're not very good at 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 orchestrating the mechanisms of time. And uh, this is one of the very important aspects. Now, there's a whole history of, of small-scale modeling that deals with both expressing larger figures and, and smaller things. In, uh, and Don and I, I think I did see Don somewhere, started here, we started the whole uh, development of, of, of material modeling uh, thinking that you, you really can begin to understand the world 
by, by trying to first make smaller things that are very compact, and that, that bring a lot of things together. And that also relates to, to the body immediately. So it relates to the womb, which is a, a beautiful architectural uh, construct in a way, place of origin. The, the hand, and I often talked about the thinking hand, it's a metaphor, and yet it is necessary because um, if you are not yet into any kind of theoretical framework, or you don't know <laughs> yet what theory is, it's often good to do something that, that, that I call intuitive modeling, that's making with the hands an object, there's a kind of, kind of thought product itself. And because it is material itself, it already indicates something, there's kind of meaning in the world. In other words, the propensities of the material either indicate time, for example, decay, or indicate complexity, uh, like the, 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 yeah, the grain of, of, of wood. So, uh, <coughs> this was actually something we stirred up at, at, at the time when we started here in '83, and it was quite an important point to also have that uh, that freedom, to the didactic freedom, to be able to, to just work with very small conditions, and then begin to, to project them out. Could this is quite an important issue? Could the world be like the object I've just made? So, could the world be like like this sphere? And yes, of course, it is probably right now like this because. There's probably some hurricane somewhere <laughs> on, on the coast of Florida. Right? There's a, there are the trade winds going across the oceans. So yes, there is often a, a, a report between an object you have, even accidentally made, and, and the world at, at large. And it's important to begin to, to play with these reports, go back and, and forth. Uh, uh, and a, a very important aspect of the, the, the school itself as a touch in the world, and I will come back to this later in a different way, is the is the uh, ability to do that and the ability to treat it as an architectural program also. Now that that's leads to one other point, which is uh, uh, an important aspect, is the, is the aspect of beauty, the aesthetics and beauty, that I think it is in this world where we have incredible discoveries in, 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 in biotechnology, scientific and advances and so on and so forth. It is also important that A, you get confidence in the making of things that you can control still, that you have uh, you are within reach, and B, that you're able to give them a spark, a spark in such a way that they can move somebody else without necessarily having to go through a, a, a large-scale discourse. So is it possible to move somebody through something you make just because of its, its quality, its aesthetics, its, its beauty? And I think this touches on a lot of issues, such as, uh, as, as collective memory, symbols of public spaces, and so on and so forth, which always play an important part in the uh, in, in culture at, at large. So the uh, yeah, that it goes a little bit further still the, the 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 making of the object, because the the body itself is such an object as well. And uh, for a long time, we actually stayed very close in the work with to the body and using the body itself as a model, as a, as a, as a construct. Partly on the assumption that the, the body is, a, um, yeah, is itself a representation of the universe, each person, in a way, is a representation of the universe. Of course, trouble starts when that universe doesn't quite fit the other universes. And that's where it gets, gets interesting. Um, that perception, the perception of the body, it, it, yeah, constructs the world as such. But I want to make a shift by reading a few of the, the manifesto lines of the, the book uh, Urban Flotsam. I'm, I'm, I'm moving now from this, this, this yeah, highly personalized model that we, I think we always need. Um, the skin of the earth wraps the earth, which is this, this, this rough skin here. Cities form the second skin. The dynamics of the earth affect the second skin. The increasing complexity of the second skin calls for the definition of a new practice and with it a new toolbox for the construction and management of cities. Like the earth's skin, cities are plastic environments that undergo constant change. Geological force cause changes in the skin of the earth. What forces cause changes in the second skin? A city is a life form. It has emotions. 
To understand the second skin as a dynamic environment requires an awareness of its emotions. The emotions of the city are called proto-urban conditions. Proto-urban conditions agitate the second skin. Proto-urban conditions cause change in the incessant flux of the second skin to bring about new phenomena that seem to follow lines drawn on an invisible map, a map that prescribes the behavior of cities. The city as a life form has to be maintained, its evolution sustained. To do so, proto-urban conditions must be known. Their manifest manifestations recognized. The drone of the traffic disturbs the quiet. The wind blows through the trees, taking the leaves. Lust determines the behavior of the afternoon. Exchange dealings. The Dow Jones is up. Fear and desire permeate, permeate the night. Our alarm systems go off. The chat rooms of the internet are full of people, pretending they're not themselves. Other genders. Memory becomes a toponymy. Here was once a church. Now only the name remains. So I move from individual work to dis the discovery of, of cooperative structures. It's got four points I will move through slowly. One first point is intuitive thinking. Decisions without decisions. Beauty of small worlds and of touching inner agitation and turning it into matter. I think this is a key aspect of any school of architecture. The second one is the building up of a personal narrative. <coughs> the third one are didactic tools, systemic methodologies, building up of core skills. The fourth one are the invention of, of such tools for things that we don't know yet. I think the education is moving into new waters. This second skin of the city which wraps the earth is a very amorphous world. It's a very fluid world. And we are not very certain yet how to move into it. So on the one hand, I, 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 I'm arguing for an inner world which is this kind of sublime isola isolation. The second one is an outer world which is full of messy interactions. Now, the messy interactions are things like climatolog climatological transformations, political mutations. As you know, we're all following what's happening in the United States at the moment. But also Burma, for example, is undergoing complex political changes. The north of Canada, tribes claiming their own rights of land. These are messy, these things. So how, how do we deal with this volatility of the world in terms of personal narratives? Now there's a whole yeah, history of, of, of methodological approach which, which try to, to aim a very personal um, way of working towards this, this more messy work. And, uh, to start here at AA, the AA during the 70s and 80s was a kind of fairly enclosed touched world in which large scale themes were, were addressed, attached, uh, attacked. You probably know the people that were here at the time, Rem, Dalibor, Daniel Liebeskind, Zaha, Nigel Coach, Chumi, and so on. Uh, they developed thesis work here and they turned the school into a kind of liminal period in which was a, a, a kind of laboratory, a sort of ex experimentation zone, a meta space, away from the society outside. And you may know that, that, that Alvin Bryarski, who was leading that period, was always at odds with the society around, around him. He just never managed to really create a, a very clear exchange with the professional world at large. And yet, project here created alternative worlds, alternative realities, which became later firm programs for the architects I've just mentioned, some of which are speaking, speaking here. So this, this was a period in which things were born here at the AA on the basis of very individual work. It was a kind of meta space of education in which pure experiment could happen. And, and, and we would fight to make sure we would get accreditation on the basis of that experiment. 
is accreditation is an important bit. I'll come back to that a bit later. Where does thesis come from? It, it, it probably started at, uh, at Cooper Union. Uh, John Haydock is, as far as I'm aware, the first who introduced the, the thesis as a, as a core project at the end of the education. I was a student at, uh, at, at, uh, at Cooper once for a year. And uh, I experienced, the first of all, the, the didactic tools that he had developed, which were, in fact, <coughs> touch and belts by themselves, the nine square grid problem. Although I came in there without any kind of place, so I, uh, it was quite fantastic, because I did the, this nine square grid problem for several, um, several weeks. And then he asked me, how do you feel? I said, fine, I'm doing it well. And he said, well, maybe you should move. I said, OK, if you want me to move. I just finished the nine square grid problem, built it, right? And he put me into fifth year. So uh, you know, he made me jump across the school from first to fifth year, in, where I totally drowned. Because the fifth year was built up at the time as a place in which individual thesis work was being developed. People were in a kind of dream state, and they were going deep into the work uh, that they would find themselves. And they would discover this world bit by bit, as it were, going along. And uh, I, of course, didn't know what the hell I, I was going to do that. So it took me a long time to get into that. But then I discovered that there was an incredible richness in, in this, this uh, in individuality. Now, this work was further developed by uh, uh, various teachers, including myself, Don, and others here, in terms of giving uh, students space to develop their own theme and to develop their own production method for that theme. Um, it was tough, but it worked at times. Although, again, it was very difficult to defend products that came out of there to, to the RBA uh, people. This has been developed further, and this is more an example uh, I want to make, in, in, the, in the Berlach under Bill Arts. Uh, I, I think it became a very interesting period there in which the, the thesis became a, a, a structure, a core structure of the institute. Students would do projects, core projects, but during a period of two years, would start to develop individual themes. And bit by bit, over several years, there, there, there was an incredible array of themes that started to, to be developed. Uh, people were doing work in, 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 in Lagos, in Johannesburg, in Bangalore, in the Sami villages in Finland looking at, 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 at tools, <laughs> doing quite radical work on infrastructure. And there was a hint of the beginning of, of an overall structure of themes and issues that could be addressed by this thesis work. Unfortunately, it didn't quite get there. It also we left before that this project could be completed in terms of actually making a kind of map on where these projects would occur in the world and how they begin to link to each other. There was the beginning of also an in interactive structure between the different projects. That's something that would have to be developed in Bangalore because of the growth of the IT industry. Actually could work as well in Johannesburg. So there was a kind of a give over of, of, uh, of, of yeah, concepts across the skin of the earth. However, <coughs> the, um, although this became quite methodological, it, it was also messy, partly because the, the world was messy and partly because it became very hard. I mean, on the one hand, it is something I would absolutely favor anywhere that you get a period of two years in which you have a totally individual uh, kind of course of discovery. And this is actually something I want to draw out. It's a diagram that belongs to that. It's, a, it's, it's about non-linear non learning. If you, now the thesis works a bit like this. You, you start here. I don't know if you can see this. Um, and you, you, let's say there's a goal here, and you go out for this for this goal here. There. And if you have enough time to get lost, and this is I forgot actually to say the most extreme version is is something that in fact Donna Bates and myself experienced in the Liebeskind in Cranbrook, which was the ultimate ultimate thesis development, brutal but also very intense. You, you would try to go towards a goal, but of course, somewhere halfway the line, you discover there's another goal somewhere here. 
And you go say, okay, all right, change direction. I, I think I like this goal better, so I go there. And uh, then, of course, you're a bit along the way, you're discovering another girl there. You say, well, okay, I'll go there, fine. <coughs> a few months further, you, you realize there's a goal which is the exact opposite of what you were trying to do before, which is, which is somewhere here. And you're going in that direction. And then, again, of course, this goes on. You discover another goal until somebody says stop. <laughs> Enough. Or you have to graduate. <laughs> now you have to graduate. <laughs> now this is five weeks time you, you have your exams or whatever. So what you have to do is effectively say, all right, stop. That's where my, my graduation is. All right. How do I graduate? Well, not, of course, with the, <laughs> not, of course, with the last, last arrow. Because that's not long enough. There's not enough there. But with somehow a field, which I would call, I call this field alpha, which somehow en encapsulates the, the, the total history of your, of your search and, and, and development. This is a, I think this is maybe easier. Doesn't matter. This is a key diagram for, for individual research, individual development. It, it, it moves from the, the attachment world, the small world, into a larger world, into field alpha. But there's always a discrepancy between, between the goals you have and, and, and this field here, which will, of course, probably remain a program for the rest of your life, or at least the next five years, or something like that. It gets, however, very messy. There are, there are problems with this system. And uh, towards the end, in the, uh, both in, 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 in Cranbrook, we saw some people also suffering from it. Uh, not being able to deal with it until at the end there was a completely co collective project. Or in the Berlag also, some people actually entered a kind of madness at some point. Why? Because these themes are, that they, they were taken on. In other words, these small worlds were not so small anymore. They became big worlds. And they, you, as a single person, you cannot take on the world. You just cannot deal with the complexity of the world alone as an architect. And there were some, yeah, some messy moments, difficult moments, tragic moments even. There's also some, I have to tell you actually one anecdote, which, is, which shows you how that, keep that problem continues even further. There was a, uh, uh, an art, a large curatorial program in Sao Paulo uh, last two years ago, I think. Um, a guy named Prisak curating, bringing people in like Rem Kolhas. To, to Sao Paulo, and uh, as far as I get the story right, he, he, uh, there is one tower in Sao Paulo, which is a vertical favela, and, uh, and uh, Nelson Bissac asked, uh, asked Rem, okay, what do you want to do in Sao Paulo? And Rem ar drove around and, of course, found the tower, because he was in interested in tower. He said, I want to do something with this tower. So they went inside, and uh, it's, uh, you can, although this is a vertical fa fa favela, and it looks, oh, everything is stuck, the elevators didn't work, and uh, yeah, it was just messy, you couldn't get in and out even. So, so uh, Rem said, okay, it needs an elevator. So can we get an outside elevator just to, to clog it, you know, to unclog the, this, this, this thing? So he, t he told them, look, uh, you know, get Schindler to, to sponsor an, uh, an elevator. Schindler didn't move, so Rem said, okay, I'm Rem Kohlhaas, I can call phone Mr. Schindler, and he phoned Mr. Schindler, and uh, said, look, can you give me a, an elevator? And, and apparently, I, there was an agreement, and it would work. They would give an elevator. What happened next is that there was a phone call that came in at the uh, organizer's office, in which uh, a man said, look, if you, uh, if you build this elevator, we'll kill you. And that was, of course, the end of the project. And this is the kind of messiness that you, that suddenly, that you suddenly hit. You know, it, it comes home, suddenly, at some point, <laughs> probably when you don't expect it. On the basis of, of, of having a thesis, and the thesis is all right, and then suddenly you interchange with the, the messiness of the world outside there. And it takes something else. It takes another kind of level of, of research in which you would be able to negotiate that messiness I want to move back into the AA and talk about another person who was a bit strange, crazier than Rem actually. His name is Gordon Pask. 
I, uh, I want to bring up the memory of, of Gordon Pask for a moment. He, uh, Gordon Pask was an extravagant, strange, brilliant figure who was around the AA for many years, usually uh, at the bar drinking white wine. And he was really something uh, absolutely uh, strange, very English in his strangeness. And uh, in fact, the first time I came here, when I arrived at AA, <coughs> stayed at Alban's house, came here up, went to the bar, and there he was. And I, I needed a place to eat, so I asked him where could he eat, so he showed me this Indian restaurant, and I started to talk to him. him. Then I, later on, I started to collaborate with him for several years. He, in fact, taught with us in the unit. He seemed interested in us. I was kind of interested in him. He's, he's one of the fathers of cybernetics, cybernetic theory. He's, in fact, one of the fathers of the computer in his earlier youth. He started to develop the first thinking machines. Well, when he was here, he was already in a kind of different phase of his life, not his prime anymore, in a kind of decline. Yet he was, he, he, he was brilliant. I have to admit something. I have to say that uh, although I taught with him, I had no clue what he was about. Absolutely not. And you know, didn't research very much, I must say. Didn't. But somehow there was it, it clicked. Somehow we worked together, and he, he interacted. And uh, we even did, for two years, we ran a lecture series called Chaos and Order. This has nothing to do with the chaos theory, which came after. Somehow we tried to deal with this you know, volatility of the world, and somehow w w what are the basic questions that could come in there? which he had already been asking in his series. And we started to ask them then. Now I understand much better what he's about. And I wish he were here, but he's not. He died in 96. Uh, At that time, there was a moment when we started to, to, to in the teaching, to develop the first layers of what, what Mark already mentioned, this, this, uh, this yeah, kind of protocol, this, this structure called the, the Urban Gallery. It's based on four questions that go back to, to my introduction. How to see, how to play, how to tell, and how to act. Now, how to see goes back to, to how, how do you actually know anything about these proto-urban conditions, about the stuff that kind of stirs the second skin? But how do you know anything about this? How do we, how do we map these things? Of course, there are statistics, but a lot of things are not, you can't put into data and <coughs> statistics. So how do we even describe those things then? So proto-urban conditions are in a way things that cause conflict, that cause form in a city. How do we play? It's very important that you, that you not think so seriously about, about these big things that, that make up the world, but more about things that move around, that can be played with. Le Corbusier at, at some point said that, that you know, planning a city is like moving the objects of your breakfast table around. I don't quite believe in that, but it's a nice image. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> that, that, that these things that you begin to see are actually things you can play with as an architect. And I think, again, to come back to the, to the education, it's, it's, it's important that you, that you always see the necessity of play with things. What if you do this? What if you do that? Uh, how to tell, which has to do with telling each other about what you did, nar creating narratives about possibilities while you're playing with the objects of the world. Having a conversation with, with, with your peers about possibilities, about concepts, having a market of ideas, creating an interaction of participation. How to act is really, of course, how to build, but also when there's no client, how do you still build? Or how do you make a project? Or in urban environments, how do you set something in motion so that you're not uh, left over to the mercy of the, of the councils? How are the conventional tools that you can use and how can you use them or how can you mutate them into creating something more new? I'm involved at the moment in a, in a project with Hackney, uh, Hackney Council and there's no client there. There's a consortium of loosely Loose groups, you know, Hamilton Hospital and Hackney Council, and it's incredible. They don't know what they want. They don't know how they can even know what they want, how they can plan. It's really incredible. And I think it shows up, it shows me uh, very clearly the task we have in, in, in formulating uh, to them the wa ways of working. 
this is what I call <laughs> being didactic towards authorities. In fact, I think, let me jump ahead for a moment. I think the real problem at the moment is, is not so much the education of educational, in educational institutions, but education of decision makers and education of planners and authorities. Like this is the real task we're having at the moment, we're having to face. Um, now how to do that, I'll, 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 s I'll jump to another bit. We have to, of course, get a grip on form. So form as beauty, form as space, form as organization, or form as socioeconomic and political tools. In, uh, in 88, uh, I developed an exhibition that, that had to do with the unification of, uh, of East and West, the cultural centers in East and West Berlin. And I created a series of models that had to do with, with a sort of connectivity between them. Now, this was, of course, when nobody could imagine that they would unify, including myself. Then it happened a year, year later. And I thought back to, the, to this form. It, it was a, a kind of zigzag form, a kind of form of stitching of two cut off and separated worlds. Now the form there was not the one kind of stitching, but was the principle of stitching together these two communities. So form is not something fixed. Form is, is, is an organization that it can, yes, it can be materialized in, in a shape. And I think what is very important is that we, we learn how to, how to handle in, 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 in urban environments the second skin, this, this form that is never quite fixed. Because your, your partners will constantly change. Or if you do one thing, it triggers the flows and you have to adjust so that you're stitching, in this case of the East and West cultural centers across the wall of Berlin, it, it, it moves around. So how do we begin to learn about form of as, as organization? Now, what we started doing then is, is to, with the help of Gordon, but actually later on without, still without understanding him, um, developing, starting to develop a, a, a way of interacting wi within the teaching which was based on an on a, on a, on a, on a organizational forum between different components. It had really to do with something that Gordon Pass developed, which was called conversation theory. I, again, I didn't understand it at the time, now I'm beginning to see that it actually is at the basis of a lot of what we are doing which has to do with really you know, what you now call peer-to-peer -peer action and uh, decision-making between different partners. And I will not get into that actually now in detail. We developed out of methodologies that were parallel to what he was working on, a, a kind of learning structure. It, it originally was meant as a planning structure. It, then it grew more and more in a learning structure as well in which we try to answer those four questions, how to see, how to play, how to tell, and how to act, with actual layers in something that metaphorically we call the urban gallery, but is in fact a kind of knowledge management tool, or I would actually call it a new type of public domain. Um, by the way, Gordon's theory, if you're interested in, is actually in fact about learning environments. Um, so, this, this, this structure is, is, is based on the understanding and somehow the logging in of, of, of proto-urban conditions and ability to, to, to pool them. It's, it's based, so that's, that's, that's one layer, it's, it's, it's called a database. Then, although I begin to hate that word because it refers to other uh, things, not about data actually, it's, it's, it's about basic knowledge of proto-urban conditions. It's about innovation or prototypes. It's about the creation of scenarios, about how a project can evolve, how interaction can take place, and it's based on these action plans that I <coughs> talked about, which is very much using existing structures to, to realize, right, realize a project. Um, I'll, I'll sketch the basic structure of this thing. I'll do it again upside, well, shift it like that. No, maybe I'll, I'll do it like that. So, so it's, it's a virtual structure that consists out of these laid layers, it's a, it's a real meta space. It's, 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 it's applying this, this condition of the touch and weld towards a methodological uh, planning and learning tool in which this is the, the basis of the prototype basis. Sorry, this is the, uh, the database. This is the prototype basis. This is the scenario basis. And here's the action plan basis. We started developing this here in the AA during two years, a period of two years. Then took it, I took it further in the Berlage. Now, it, it has to do, of course, with, with the handling of management, but it, 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 since the internet, it, it makes it possible to use it as an interactive 
public domain. And the whole idea about it is going back to the stitching again, to, to create interconnectivity between different components. Actually, you begin to stitch the project through its different layers, from scenario games towards digging out basic materials about the knowledge of certain flows towards an action plan again. Now this is <laughs> better, maybe like this. Now this, this core structure we've been testing now in a series of uh, both learning environments and, uh, and uh, also a series of, of, of quasi commissions, half commissions, one in the f from the city of Copenhagen, one by the the, the Rijkswaterstaat, which is the central body of infrastructure and water in the Netherlands, in which it became, in fact, not a building anymore. It's never been a building. It's a purely organizational tool in that's, that deals with the with two questions. How can this institute that governs all of the major construction in the Netherlands, in, including it, the protection against water sources, how can it in, innovate itself, reform itself, which is the kind of question you're facing as well, and how can it deal with, with the integral complex problems that, that are hitting it right now, for which it is not, not pre prepared. So we're, in fact, building a, a, a dynamic concept organization for this, this, uh, this national institute at, at this moment, which will have, a, have an implicit urban gallery built in its organizational structure. There's nothing there. It's not about computers or about, about floors or anything like that. It's about, effectively, about management concept. <laughs> That sounds maybe very unpoetic, but in fact, it is quite important if you deal with the future of a country like the Netherlands in, in, in terms of you know, what, what happens with the, 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 you know, the, the, the rising of the water level. Now, what we were not aware of is, uh, this is the kind of last component where I want to really go, is that it was an open source system. I, I, again, I didn't know much about it. At some point, uh, we, got, we started to get questions, people saying this is actually an open source system, especially when we started to use it on large scale in the Netherlands and Germany, we, we, we applied it in, uh, on invitation of authorities on a, on a zone of space between Rotterdam and the Ruhr Rhein Metropolis. One of my better students then developed a, uh, it's a small thing I have to tell you, a, a, a prototype concept inside the, 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 uh, the urban gallery structure, which, by the way, we use then as a learning structure in the Berlage. We've been using it for two years. Now, the interesting thing there was not so much that we could use this, this tool in the zone for different prototypes to interact, because that's what we were doing. We were always merging prototypes, letting them develop. But the prototype was about using 200, a 250 kilometer long zone of the densest, densest city part in, a, in, in Europe to create wind energy with new technology. Now, this is impossible. There is no possibility to do that on a political uh, decision-making level. So we discovered that actually this whole idea of tool system, of planning tools like this, albeit based on very concrete propositions of uh, creation of wind energy using all the surface of, of, a, of a big zone, it had nothing to do with windmills, by the way, it's very small prototypes. That a tool like this becomes a political tool. It becomes a, an instrument that in fact we need, not for our own interaction, our own learning, but in fact to create new, new types of administrative systems or even new types of, of new forms of democracy in these areas. Because e the EU is a very nice thing uh, so far, but I think so, at least. But there is very little transnational planning yet happening across the borders, for example, between Germany and the Netherlands. So the nation state is actually still very powerful there, although the problems and the, 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 the new Euro regions are totally internationalized and totally transnational. So more and more, we discover that the tools we're we are looking at are in fact learning tools for with, with, with political intent. And I think this is something very, very important. I know that that's the, there are experiments with, with open source systems here in the school, the DRL, for example, on its website, that talks about um, the DRL is strongly committed to a collective team-based peer-to-peer model of teaching and, learn and learning the design concepts, tools and systems associated with today's most advanced forms of contemporary architectural design and thinking. The AADRL studios are modeled on an open source approach to questions of intellectual property, authorship and creativity, by which it promotes the active sharing and swapping of all research and experimentation undertaking within the program's design courses. Now the a DRL is, is, a, is another sketch I want to make for a moment. If you have a, it, it often happens in schools. There's a, you know, you have a body, 
and then something happens inside the body, it's a, it's kind of the founding of something, and then the body begins to push the boundaries, goes partly out of the boundaries, pops out, as it is now in, in John's Street uh, near Farringdon Road, and move, you know, moves kind of on. And I think this is also an issue that right, you will have to deal with. Now, I believe that these I, we checked the, the website of officially re registered open source systems. They, they, last year they went from uh, 60,000 to 90,000 in the world. I think they're slowly descending on us, the things that we, we will not avoid. They, will, they are part of the systems we live in now. So one question is, 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 it, is it possible to, to learn something from them in terms of the way they are advertising using an open source system to help somehow getting the AA ready for the, the uh, ubiquitous use of open source systems and potentially using it as a teaching tool. Now the open source system of the DRL is not yet quite a, 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 an open source system as is, is defined by the people that have developed things like that. One of the things that is important about an open source system is the, um, um, is the ability apart from peer-to-peer -peer -peer learning, is the ability to actually change the, the whole mechanism, the tools th themselves. And this is something highly dangerous, highly political, but also highly important, I think, that is a change from within. Uh, and I think there's, there's something that can be, be learned, but while using the, I think, the, the, the actual protocols of open source systems themselves. Now, if you look at the websites talking about open source systems, I'm not talking so much about Linux, but the, the open source systems go further, they are in fact also quite political in content. And that leads me to the last point. A um, few points. I, have, I've, 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 I had a bit of a look at the, at the, the constitution of the, of the AAA. I've, I've run a, an English charity for 10 years, so I, I know what charities can do. I know a bit about charity law. And I think it is, it is, it is possible to actually take a stance using the, the, um, the charity laws to say, okay, we are an educational body. But we are doing two things. One is we are establishing a series of much deeper research institutes. I think Winnie will talk about this on Monday as well. He, he will talk, I think, about an institute that takes about three years that goes into quite a quite depth of certain phenomena like climatological change and things like that. Now, why would you do that in such a way, keeping it partly separate, sorry, <laughs> like that. Why you do that? Because of money. Because there are a lot of grants at the moment possible for a type of research you cannot do as a school, but you can do as a, as a charity if you set yourself self up for a certain kind of research. And the second thing is, so one, one part of that is research. Second part is, is operational testing. Now, to give you one example, the, the EU at the moment is, on the one hand, you know, it's, it's going to influence the accreditation of, of you, like any other school. But on the, uh, on the other hand, they are screaming for concepts. It's not true that it's just, they're just bureaucrats kind of climbing down. I've talked to, to leaders of, for example, Interact. It's a program that has money for transnational uh, programs. They are screaming. They say, look, we don't get the project. They have 10 million euros, and they just don't get the project. Because authorities, local authorities, don't know how to create the kind of conceptual projects that, that, that we can. So can, as a, as a school, can you actually get involved in operational programs funded by the EU, in this case, to fund a, a special operation that is part in, part out, in which you create an exchange between the students following a more normal, uh, uh, more, more, more normal type of curriculum and entering for a while at least this deeper and more long-term term research. But again, I have to say, it's not just about the research, it's about money as well, about the ability to get grants that are around for the types of crises that are coming at the moment. Um, one other thing is the... I know there's an ongoing system about the unit system. Now the unit system 
immerse under, under Alvin. And when I looked at it recently again in terms of in the light of the, 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 the open source system, in fact, the Unisys system is a kind of open source system. I know it's often seen as, as, as a series of bastions of saying, okay, this is my theme and the loyalty to our one unit makes you not deal with other units. But actually, it's also about interconnectivity, about looking at what everybody else is doing, shifting across the school back and forth. Once you have the, the, the potential of the, of and the technology of the open source systems, there's also a possibility that you actually start to look at the connectivity without all the units. Now, once you do that and you combine those two things, there's another issue. And this is the last issue, which is this. Open source systems are based on, on the web, for example. That means they're actually geographically ubiquitous. They are, to go back to, to this thing, they are forming the second skin of the, of the earth. And I think there is a, once you have a system like that, you add to that the component of if you are operational, you become in fact what we call an urban curator, which I think is a new discipline. And I think it should be part of any school, uh, contemporary school. Now, since you have students coming to the AA, this is the world again. You have students coming from the whole world towards the AA, creating this internationalization that that's, that's, uh, people at DRL talking about. Is it possible also to imagine an educational system which in fact deals in a kind of real time fashion with, uh, in an open source system you call it hives. Real time testing environments in different places either where the students come from, but that's not actually necessary. You could also say particular zones where there's an emergence of a certain kind of urbanism about which we know nothing, for which we don't have tools or no solutions. Is it possible to create a simultaneity? Now, it's possible if you indeed begin to play with open source systems, look at how thesis projects can be de developed within that, set up a finance system that allows you these, these kinds of satellites that are either uh, research satellites or satellites that are active. I mean, the constitution of the AA at the moment is not about active participation in the community. <coughs> this, this kind of touching the messiness of life, but it can do so, in fact, and it can treat it as a, as a learning environment. Can it do so by also digging in its own history can you as an AA digging, digging into your own history, this is probably the last diagram I have, which is, is about looking what's happened here, Gordon Pask, Archigram, Cedric Price, Ram, and so on, to look back, we're here, to look back, to partly be here and to partly look forward. And is it possible to, to take the political risks that you will have to take in order to leap forward far enough to deal with the kind of technologies that are around us. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have some time for questions. Questions? Here. Uh, where do you get the confidence for saying you're willing to take political risk? Look, I think you have to because the. Uh, Sorry? Uh, I'm interested in knowing where he gets the confidence for saying we must take, willing to take political risks. 
Well, there's several reasons there. A, A is, uh, you know, the AA at the moment has a kind of independence. And uh, that has been good, but it, you know, it can also be bad. And you know, there's an issue about whether, at the moment, the time has come for large schools. Some say that you know, the large schools like MRT actually <coughs> hold the future, right? So where do you position yourself as a small school, as an independent school? Now, the larger school cannot m move. They're very much fixed to, to certain accreditation uh, structures. You are too, but not as much as they are. So how can you use that, that uh, independence? Now, I think that's, that the, you know, the main schools that are really having, having to deal with our accreditation boards, EU regulations, and so on, they have to follow that. It's very hard to, to disagree with that. I think there's, you actually have to turn around that whole issue. You actually have to say, yes, but hold on. We are the ones who should tell the regulators the, uh, what, what, really, what the world is like, what the problems are like, in fact. And, and, and we should show prototypes of, of regulations or, or concepts of regulations, which then come back in terms of accreditation rules and things like that. Now, that, is a, that, that means taking a risk because you're, you have to look ahead, farther ahead than perhaps other institutions can do. Because and this goes back to the, the real core of what do you do with a touching world? Well, you speculate in it. You speculate about the world. And you have to speculate about the world because if not, you're just following. You just have to deal with the regulations. But what if you're trying to be ahead? And so where, where would it go? And how can we be ready for it? How can we plant the seeds? But, and then how can we provoke those that make the accreditation for the learning institutions that set the regulations into, into also coming with us, you know, altering what they have to do. Now, that's highly risky because you may get it wrong. You may just be off totally. And I think those risks uh, are worth taking. Because if you don't take them, I think there are shifts that are happening now in the landscape of technology. I mean, look already at the landscape. Look, look at the Biennale at the moment. Uh, you know, have a good look at the Biennale. Make your own judgment exactly what's happening there. <coughs> or uh, different schools. There's a kind of similarity that it begins to happen because of technology. But also, there's a it's sort of geographic universality begins to, that begins to happen, uh, w uh, like the internet, which is good. It's a new type of space. How can we, how can we inhabit that space? One of the things, for example, that I, I, I was rushing a bit at the end, that I think is important with this kind of real-time test environments that you can, can run, is that, that there are now a lot of global forces that act in similar ways on, on very different environments. But the symptoms, the conflicts, look different. They look different, and yet they're the same. They're very much the same. But they're colored by the local differences. So that means they ne need to be studied uh, on a much more, uh, yeah, in fact, on a global level. And, and very few people are doing that in a cons concerted way. <laughs> and so I think, you, what can you do if you're an independent school and you have a high degree of internationalization? I think you should use that in order to look at these things that are of, of caused by global conditions that are internationalized, that are cross-border. Cross because not everybody can do that. And the, the types of prototypes I'm, I'm talking about, well, there's another issue, there's a political issue as well in, in um, how do we relate to other parts of the world? <laughs> Maybe that's, that's another kind of discussion. How do we give back also something to the world? <laughs> Question here. Why is that political relating to other parts of the world? Isn't that like humane or something? Isn't that something that we're supposed to make anyway? Reaching out to other parts of the world? Yeah, sure, but how you do it? No, yeah, no, but the why is that political? Involving governments, you mean, or funding EU or otherwise? Well, one of the things that are happening right now is the emergence of, of, of uh, NGOs and, and um, uh, you know, open source systems that are cross-boundary, that are not directly related to governments. And there, there's a whole issue of, of well, there's, there's talk about you know, direct d democracy. I have a lot of trouble with still with that, that notion, whether that actually exists. <coughs> but is there a way of, of a different form of government using some of these systems? I would just like to raise a question, which is maybe 
more provocative than, than real. Would it be possible to bypass uh, uh, the lack of signing of the Kyoto Treaty by, by, by the US government? Is it possible? Maybe, maybe eventually. And that has to do with the, with the creation of different types of spaces that, that bypass these, uh, uh, yeah, the, this, the spaces as set, for example, in this, in this case by the US government. The same is something, this, this, uh, what we are trying to do in, 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 in testing this particular application of the urban gallery in the zone between Rotterdam, Mainport, and, and the rhine ruhr metropole. Is it possible to bypass national governments and to test the conditions of a democratically backed, backed testing of, of a prototype that is necessary? And there's a whole range of other prototypes that haven't really talked about, but they have to deal with, with you know, containment of waste and things like that. Or the, or you know, the creating of the conditions for a prototype that simply cannot happen at the moment because you have to rewrite all the laws of, of property, land ownership, and things like that. So I think it has to do also with this, the, 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 the negotiation about testing environments in which we can develop the prototypes that we think are necessary. And yeah, I'll just tell you one anecdote. I just looked at the website of the, the founder of the open source systems. Um, he, he, he doesn't say a thing about it. He doesn't talk about technology. He he, he, one of the propositions he's making, he said, why is there no Nobel Prize for sustainable development? I was actually shocked by the question. <laughs> why not? You know, these are important things that, that, that touch us all. Could I ask a question? Yes, please. I mean, I think if I was kind of asked to sort of characterize uh, the work that you've sort of spoken of, kind of shown, um, you know, one way of putting it is that it draws on a certain history of the AA, which includes, obviously, <coughs> that of your own unit, um, which is what you might call the development of a kind of theory and practice of relationships. Uh, and in that sense, you know, it, it's the question of the examination and indeed the making of kind of relations through connection, which is, as it were, what you might call the primary focus of the work, certainly a focus which is sort of prior to, and from your point of view, a condition of actually approaching more traditional architectural or urban yes. questions. Yes. You know, that is to say, um, the kind of pedagogic and the institutional implications of what you're saying is actually whether or not the AA uh, remains kind of concerned with what you might call more traditional views of architecture and urban intervention, it needs to be in some sense skewed by kind of starting uh, from an investigation of these relations. <coughs> That's the kind of first point. The second point is you know, I think it's interesting when you mention Gordon Pass and cybernetics. It's not as though the forces of power themselves are kind of strangers uh, to the use of kind of, of cybernetics course, of and course. whatever. Of course. And so it, it yeah. does seem to me that, that, you know, the implication is that, as it were, it's a kind of um, use of those relations in a sense in counter to what you might call the relations which are set up by, let's just give it a name, the corporate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, I think that's, you know, but I'd like to kind of slightly push you uh, in terms of, you know, like the future kind of structure of, of the AA. Now, wh what it would mean in terms of the AA, I suppose, is that some uh, units would turn to a kind of process of research, you know, which in some, but do you think that could be kind of accommodate, accommodated um, within, say, even the kind of minimal frame of accreditation? Or, you know, at some point, not now necessarily, but in the future, does one actually have to kind of say, well, actually, this preliminary to architecture becomes kind of so important that it needs, as it were, to develop its own kind of autonomous institutional space. Sorry to go so long. No, no, sure, that's, that's fine. That's a tricky question because the, on the one hand, the, the obvious answer would be yes, it needs a special institutional space. 
um, like like the other sketch I've made here, right? Something that where is it? Uh, that that is, is somehow relieved for accreditation, gets money elsewhere, tries to raise money elsewhere, <coughs> does his research over long period, creates an exchange mechanism within. That it can work if you talk about that's that's bracketed between as a kind of market. It means you have to make is it right? Yeah. That, that means you have to make sure that it's not about the institutionalization of that blob, but about the institutionalization of the market in between. However, uh, my, my favorite answer would be to, to say no. It should occur within the accreditation system. <laughs> because the, the, the I'm an external examiner myself, and, <laughs> and I know <laughs> I know the problem. I know the, I know the fight. I know the, the role we also have to play as examiners between, between the work this research is being done and the needs to bring, pe you know, bring people out in the, in the profession with, with certain skills. But I think there's a need to argue also that, that the range of skills of the architect has increased and that we need to test that increase. And maybe not everybody is willing to do that because like I said before, this, this entails risks because you're pushing the boundary and as of course you will go over it. <laughs> and there are conflicts there. And here, in, during the history of the last 20 years, we've had many of those conflicts, midnight fights between tutors and between uh, external examiners. I tell you, between mid uh, until midnight, violent fights. So I think these fights are necessary, actually. <laughs> They're very violent. <laughs> I mean, not physically violent. Well, no, not physically, but still. So I think they're <laughs> necessary because the, the, that system has to be tested as well. Uh, because I think the range of skills of the architect is, is, is expanding. Uh, because you're right to say, I think the corporate structure, uh, private enterprise and so on, they're expanding their field of operations. So we cannot stay with the, within the certain limited confines that have been given us uh, to where this the last 20 years. But we have to be kind of wily in the way that, that, that we are dealing with the, the, the corporate, corporate uh, structure out there as well. Um, yeah, I've got a question about um, founding research satellites. We've got this um, place in Hope Park, you might know about it, like a um, workshop and sleeping. And I was wondering if you think that maybe you should found it as like a separate research unit, f separate from the AA, or maybe we should found a second <coughs> school which works on its own, or what, what do you think how we should use it, because it's not really clear at the moment. Which, which is it? It's it's called Hope Park. It's in Dorset. It's um, oh, see, a yeah, workshop yeah. with yeah. like um, yeah accommodation units, and yeah. usually people go there for like a couple of days and work something there. Well, I I, I, I can't give you practical answers. I'm not here to, to prescribe to you how to run this this kind of thing. I'm no more sketching out a, a another kind of goal structure, but a. Perhaps I, would, I just want you, this, this is a kind of metaphorical sketch that I often, uh, I love this, you know, this notion of the incubator of, of is it right? No. <laughs> you know, things are always born out of, out of an established body. And then they move off. I mean, you'll see that. that many things have been born, not us, the DRL or that place you're talking about. I think there's always this debate. It's a point where it, it, it just goes off and is something else. Or is there a point where it <coughs> comes back in and actually creates a, it creates a reinvigoration of the, of the ritual body? Look, there are no solutions, no instant questions, no instant. Uh, I, no, I, I don't know. You have to deal with that yourself. But I think you have to deal with that in the larger, in the larger context of that. I think it is, an, it is good that things are, are placed outside. My warning would be, look, yes, I think it is very good. I don't like the word satellites, by the way. I, I like uh, uh, the word hive better, or, or, or simultaneous pods that, that can exist because of the, you know, this, the certain technologies that make simultaneity possible. So that these touch and dwells I talked about before are, different, are, are, are possible in different places at, at the same time. But you have to have a, a kind of learning concept that allows you to do that. So it's not just about one satellite that is there and then as a, you know, is it going to go on, or on its own or not? I don't think it's, it's about that scale. Okay, that's Francois. Hi. In, in, in your small world, uh, w uh, world where the, um, you have interaction and, uh, and things are 
reoriented, reoriented it by themselves or finding new uh, new path all the time. What is the relation when you actually have a, a, an external uh, uh, interaction when some things come inside that world? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the whole issue of small world as being um, independent is relative. It's completely relative. It, I, on the level of <coughs> learning and didactics, I would say it doesn't need to create a protective environment to for a while to speculate with the world without immediately getting the resistance of outside forces. On the other hand, this, when I was talking to about this, 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 uh, <coughs> this tool, this Urban Gallery tool, of course all points that I draw here are points that are linked to the outside world. I mean, all of these, these points here are, are, are mappings of, of processes that exist in, in a certain environment. Here you have either, either uh, well, what, what we call thesis work, namely a kind of a general philosophy about why you take the decisions. Or you have, you have th this is the action plan, you have the regulations from the outside. Here, when I talk about the scenarios, you deal with stakeholders in a particular environment. So, in fact, the diagram looks contained, but the reality is that at every point, outside forces come in that influence the, the diagram of the interaction. It's just that, that it's good to, to lift it out for a moment. In order to understand something more about the, the total complexity of interactions and so that you also have some control about the influence of outside forces on the way that on, on your strategy the way you set up something and I think this is increasingly important in in the way we have to work now in which where an object is always linked to other processes and always triggers other things so yeah, the, the work of an uh, if an architect is, is really like an orchestrator also. You build something and then uh, you have the consequences of what you build. So are you able to foresee some of it? Or are you able to, uh, to plant seeds of, of successive movements? That's why I think these, these things are necessary, these diagrams of that, that show connectivity. So the, the, the small world is never completely isolated. It's a, you could say it's a diagram, call it a diagram. A diagram with which you describe relationships, but in order to have clarity, you separated it out for a moment. There's nothing new about it, by the way. <coughs> no, it's part of religion, it's part of, you know, it's but I think you know, we, we need to use these tools as well. I mean, uh, Sorry? Oh yes, I was. Yes, I was saying that before that in, in a way the, the, the existing unit system is uh, is already uh, you could say is a kind of open source system. I'm not really interested, by the way, in open source systems, but uh, I think overall it's not. I think I think the range of of issues that that needs to be addressed. Is, is larger than are being addressed. And I think there is also a need to begin to be very cunning, I would almost say, about linking up as many issues and as many projects as you can. And this is a, this has also to do with, with the, 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 the changes that are happening with, for example, uh, um, yeah, authorship, intellectual property rights and things like that. How much do we still do alone? How much do individual projects begin to connect to form a type of prototype to which nobody has a single owner intellectual ownership in order to face a certain complex problem that simply nobody single can can address is the so uh, my answer is no actually <laughs> <coughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> maybe we move to like a last question um, there's one over there can someone give him In this overall scheme, do you see these, um, I hate to use the phrase, satellites or networking strategies, do you see them linking up with other forms of academia, other colleges outside the realm of architecture? Yes, absolutely. I think it's a difficult topic. It's not a scheme, by the way. Right. Well, networking, however you, you want to see. It's sketching you a kind of image. Eh? It's exactly. It's, it's right. not a plan or a scheme. But uh, I think so. I mean, one of the 
of course, if you look at other schools, one of some sometimes not uh, not 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 often, there are successful jumps over towards other other disciplines and and uh, yeah, other <coughs> components of academia. And I would say yes, these are absolutely necessary, which has to do with this widening of the the, the, the skills of the architect, partly to deal with the a certain type of inter integral projects for which we simply don't have the skills anymore. We don't even have the skills to understand them. So I think more, the more we do have to work together with, with, let's say, clusters of stakeholders or other types of experts that, that understand other components of, 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 of the problems. And it, you kind of do this in a, in a kind of you know, conversation in a bar, but I think these things have to be set up in a more systemic way over a longer period of durations. But, and here comes to maybe the political thing again, this doesn't work if it is you know, pure research. I have a pr actually a bit of a problem with this word research. I think there has to be something at stake. There has to be some kind of commitment <coughs> in which you perhaps test out what you do already. That's the kind of risk ma management, I think, <coughs> that you need to be involved in. Uh. Okay, now in fact we are going to continue this conversation up in the bar. Uh, so Raoul, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>